Welcome to The State of Us. Beyond mainstream cable news and party lines, for the millennial and a boomer, The State of Us pushes past the noise and uncovers all the issues that matter. Here's your host, Justin T. Weller. What kids can learn from losing. A hockey dad reflects on a long streak of losses that reinforced his son's love of the game and turned his team into winners. America needs history and civics education to promote unity. And students watched as they saw one of their teachers marching on the Capitol in January. This might sound like an odd assembly of items, clearly having something to do with young people and school and education. But in reality, we see them as interconnected and related to some core issues with the way that we're handling uh, our young people these days. So we get to look at the benefit of letting kids lose, the value of civics education, and to what extent uh, or not should uh, teachers be accountable for anything they do outside of the classroom. All essential conversations, and today we get to touch on each, but of course, a conversation on education in 2021 could simply not be complete without. True Chat senior historian and an educator of more than 30 years, here is your friendly redneck liberal, Lance Jackson. Well, I remember a song from the 60s, The Times They Are Changing, and now I'm 50 years away from that, and the times are still changing. But what we're going to do today is we're going to do a little reminiscing. So our word for the day is reminisce. And one of my reminisces is that spelling mattered back when I was younger. And now it's, well, we have spell check. We don't need to know to spell anything. And then, okay, but how do you know that it's spelling it correctly? So most of you may be familiar with the word reminisce, but I did not, was not aware that this is the way it's spelled. R-E-M-I-N-I-S-C-E. Reminisce. It's an intransitive verb, meaning to think, talk, or write about remembered events or experiences. And a lot of what we're talking about today has to do with the way things used to be. They're not that way right now or haven't been for the last 15 or 20 years. And now we're starting to talk about, well, maybe those things that were like that back then weren't so bad. Maybe we need to bring some of them back. But then we have this other side of the younger generation who's saying, no, we need to keep changing. These times are changing and they're not changing fast enough. So what do we have first, Justin? Reminisce. Yes. uh, What kids can learn from losing. And this is something that I think you and I have talked about a little bit before It was put in context uh, in this article in the Wall Street Journal, which, of course, is linked at thestateofus.org. By the way, as we're talking about this stuff today, Lance and I would like to know your thoughts. Uh, We actually have a couple new comments. uh, And if you're listening and sent us one recently and haven't heard back yet, don't worry. We do get around to them. It just takes sometimes it just takes some time. But please send us an email podcast at thestateofus.org. As you're listening today and have thoughts, podcast at thestateofus.org. We want to hear from you. What kids can learn from losing. I grew up in an interesting, I mean, I think it's fair to say, you know, in a, in a small town, but also in an interesting time where some of this was being played with, uh, this idea of that there is no losing for kids. Most prevalent in my mind is the change in the way the grading system in our local school district was adjusted. And you might, that might be like, what, what do you mean? Uh, well, it's called reassessment. Uh, and, and I was part of the transition class. So when I entered high school, I was part of the class that was being transitioned from the very traditional, you know, ABC, a D and F scale that most people are familiar with. And that if you fail a test, generally speaking, you failed the test. And I mean, that's just, that's what it was. And, and you got graded on homework and, you know, uh, class participation uh, often was counted as part of your grade. And basically this, this new system did away with all of that. You couldn't really be punished for not doing homework, at least not from an academic standpoint per se. You couldn't get a bad grade. So you could be handed homework, but if you didn't do it, it couldn't really impact your grade. And if you failed a test, you you had to be allowed, just to be clear, had to be allowed to retake it. So 
there wasn't really any incentive to get it right the first time around uh, because, you know, eh, I forgot to study. No big deal. If I don't do well and I want to get a better grade, I'll just go back and do it. Um, so that's kind of what comes to my mind, Lance, of that transition in culture. But obviously, it also people think of like participation awards, right? Uh, trophies, um, you know, that when you're in soccer, um, you know, and all the little kids are playing soccer, they all get their trophy, right? Um, even though it's like, well, what am I getting a trophy for exactly? Well, because you were here. And the question is, has this created a situation where now these many of these students, when they become adults, don't understand how to handle the inevitable failure uh, that they will experience in life. And not not like, oh, they're failures all the time, but when they encounter them, they don't know what to do. They, they, they don't have a, a feel for how to behave. I'm going to reminisce here, but the first trophy I ever received was in 1970, my Corey League, which was the Missouri version of Little League, uh, baseball trophy, which I still have, even though it's broken. Um, because when I got trophies or ribbons, it was because I either excelled myself or I excelled with teammates. And so I don't have a lot of superfluous things around. I have things that I worked very hard to get. And I'm just going to read from this article a little bit. I'm not going to get started on the grading system. I could go for <laughs> <laughs> I was a part of um, uh -huh. fighting that when it was put in. Yes, Lance was there, um, folks. When I was when I was going through that as a student, he was going through it on the the teaching side. But from this article, it says losing was especially edifying for my kid. It taught him a great truth of the world: for everyone good, there is someone better; for everything big, there is something bigger. In this way, he learned humility. The losing separated true players from what my grandma Esther. So now we're going way back because this is a dad speaking. But his grandmother said who separated true players from what my grandmother Esther called show ponies. That is, they measure everything that really counts. Those who love hockey and play it like they love it will not quit no matter what the circumstance. So, you know, everybody, oh, I play, I got the ribbon. I'm going to go on this. 5k run or this 10k run and I get a medal. Well, where'd you finish? Well, it doesn't matter. What was your time? Well, it doesn't matter. I get a ribbon anyway. I'm, I'm running for the t-shirt or whatever. And it's like, well, okay. And, and there's, while there's nothing wrong with that, what are we teaching or not teaching? And as this article goes on, this, the players went from 17 to 12. Kids quit because they were losing. But it only took a few moves to write the team. One child went to defense. This girl's going to take the faceoffs. That kid's in the goal. In mid March, with 30 games left to play, they began to win. They did it as a different kind of group. When they won, when they had won before, it had been with individual performance. When ahead, they'd coast. When behind, they'd quit. This new team had character and could never be counted out, no matter the score. They had learned the most important lesson in life. You can lose without being beaten. I just, that's it, right? I mean, we get up every day and we go to work. And do we go to work with the idea that, you know what, I'm going to do my best, the best job that I can do today? Or do we get up and go to work and say, you know, my boss has beat me down. The customers have beat me down. So I'm just going to coast. I'm just going to work to collect a paycheck to pay the bills. How do you approach work? You know, how do you approach your job? And I feel sorry for those people who approach it in that second way where they've been beaten down and they're not willing to continue to do their best job no matter what the score, no matter that, that, that they are beaten. And I, I think that's the point of this discussion is that nobody likes to lose. And losing is not, but it teaches you so many things. And then you have some, as I call them, tools in your toolbox to deal with those times in life as you get older, as an adult, as an older person now, when, okay, I know how to handle this setback. You know, we were talking before the show how tired I am because of the physical labor I've done for the last four days. And it's like, I never used to be this way. Okay. 
but I'm not going to sit there and be all depressed. I'm in here today. I'm going to work and I'm going to still do my exercises and I'm going to continue to fight and get better. Why? Because that's the way I approach things. And I approach those things because I have some tools in my box to deal with things when they don't go my way. And it's not to say that victories aren't formative, but when you, when, you know, I challenge our listeners to do this right now, think in your own mind. And it just came to me, Lance, for example, I remember nearly every detail about the night that I found out I lost an election. If you ask me to recount in detail the day that I found out that the youth center, a project that I work on, was receiving its first major donation from a big corporation in town, I have to think about those details. They're not they're not right there, right? They're not, ooh, you know, they're not they're not seared into your memory. And that's not Ooh, don't let go of those things. My point is, I think that it's good evidence that we are we are deeply shaped by our failures and how we choose to respond to them and what we choose to do by them in a way that winning is not. And if we remove that from the equation, we remove the opportunity to grow and to learn in the same to the same quality that you have when it's like, no, the whole you can lose that doesn't mean you have to be beaten and it sounds like a like an oxymoron but i don't think it is i think it's a it's an excellent point about the only way that you get beaten is if you don't choose to learn from that experience or become better because of it and that's what losing provides you the opportunity to do is it it shows you you know no what what was done wasn't good enough you know so what are you going to do now you know to be better at that whole point of it's an excellent point. There's always, you know, you can be good. There's always somebody that's better. Uh, you can do something big, but there's always something that's bigger. And that doesn't have to invalidate your success. But what it does need to do is, is make us humble and remember that, you know, there are other people out there doing great things and you can't be complacent and just accept that you don't need to get any better. Uh, cause then you'll get worse. It's that, you know, we talked about that whole business of if you have community A um, and it's growing at 3% and community B is growing at 8%, community A is getting worse. It's growing, but it's getting worse because it's, relatively speaking, growing slower than somebody else. So that, I guess, that's what I take away from it. And I think it's part of, you're going to hear as we go into the next part about America needing history and civics education in order to promote unity, I think a critical part of this equation. So why do we need civics education and how could that help us promote unity in this nation? Something that I think we all feel like we could probably use more of. To find out, keep it here on The State of Us and we'll be right back. We are The State of Us. Here's your host, Justin T. Weller. We've talked about losing and why it would be valuable to lose, why it might be valuable to let more students fail, but teach them how to do it and get value from it. Something something like, right, Lance, the, the only true failures are the ones that you don't learn from. That's exactly right. It yes. doesn't mean that you shouldn't say, I accept that I lost, but that's actually part of avoiding it being a total defeat is... Uh, figuring out how to grow from it. What do you take away from it? And what changes do you make so that you do a better job next time? You know, why didn't you get that contract? Why, why did that company choose to go with a different company? Okay. What did you do as the salesperson to not get that contract for your company? Okay. Evaluate it, do a better job next time. And then maybe ne the next time you're in that situation, <clears throat> since you analyzed why you didn't get the last one, You'll get the next one. Share with us your thoughts. Send us an email, podcast at thestateofus.org, podcast at thestateofus.org. This next one, again, linked is an opinion piece from the Wall Street Journal, America Needs History and Civics Education. And I just highlighted this one section because I think it sums it up pretty well. A constitutional democracy requires a citizenry that has a desire to participate and an understanding of how to do so constructively as well as the knowledge and skills to act for the common good. 
We need teaching and learning that pursues an account of U.S. constitutional democracy that is honest about the wrongs of the past without falling into cynicism and appreciative of the American founding without tipping into adulation to turn pluribus into unum. We need curriculums that achieve a more plural and complete story of U.S. history while also forging a common story, the shared inheritance of all Americans. The reason I wanted to share that, Lance, is because to me, that goes hand in hand with literally what we just talked about, right? Is we shouldn't be brushing over our failures as a nation because we do that pretty frequently, We regularly just kind of like, oh, yeah, we don't really talk about the massacre of Native Americans or the internment of Japanese Americans, right? Or just how gross the Civil War really was, right? How nasty people truly could be. We we don't like to really go into depth on those things too often in our dialogue. And we don't like to talk about how many of our founders were racists, right, or sexist uh, by modern day standards. Important note there. And the point is, and you and I have talked about this a lot before, those things do not have to invalidate the good of our country or the great prosperity, the increase in prosperity that has been seen the world over since the United States has been leading the direction. And yeah, people would point to all the atrocities of the last 70 years, but the reality is in the last 70 years, things have gotten substantially better under the direction of the United States. More people have been lifted out of abject poverty as a result of our world leadership than virtually any other time in history. And I think that's the big thing that that frustrates me with the modern news media. Oh, this is the worst in American history. And it's like, well, no, it's not. It, it, it's the worst in your lifetime, but you don't know American history. And I think that's what causes us, oh my gosh, we, we don't talk to one another anymore and we can't get the Democrats and Republicans because, and it'll never happen because it's never happened before. And again, it's because we don't understand civics and we don't understand the history because we know that it used to be that way and we could do it and we can do it and we can learn from studying the civics to get to the things that we can do instead of being defeatist, which is your winning and losing, that, well, it's just going to stay this way and there's nothing I can do about it. You know, there is. But regrettably, as this article says, civics, which teaches the skills of participation and the knowledge that sustains it, and history, which provides a frame of reference for the present, have been sorely neglected over the past half century in U.S. schools. Right now, we collectively spend 1,000, that's right, folks, 1,000 times more per student on science, technology, engineering, and math education, what's known as STEM, than we do on history and civics. Where civics is often taught, it is hampered by a lack of consensus about what to teach and how. So this new project (coughs) comes up and it says, Here's what we can do. We're going to provide guiding principles for states, local school districts, and educators across the United States. And they can, in turn, establish their own standards and tailor curriculum materials to their local communities. That's that's wonderful, okay? I mean, as a former educator, that's what I want. I don't need top-down telling me this is what we need to teach. Here are the broad concepts that need to be taught. Now, you take it and run with it in your classroom. And if you're not sure where to go, here are some ideas. Like in Texas, they may want to talk more about the war between the United States and Mexico in the 1840s, the Mexican-American War, and how that affected things and the civic duty of everybody. Or in Massachusetts, they may want to look at the American Revolution because of all the things that Massachusetts did to create this country. But the point is, you're going to have these overarching concepts that those students are going to learn from whatever it is they study. So it's not what you study, but it's what you pull out from the events to study that will teach the civics and and put it together with the history so that it means something. So people will begin to, young people will begin to participate. And you say, well, why this focus on young people today? Folks, that's the future. Even if you could change somebody in their 60s, like me, you know, somebody who's soon to be 60, even if you could change them, which 
I don't know if you can or not. We've got 15 or 20 years left. How big of a difference can we make in the world? How big of, can we make in the country and change things? But if you get 12 to 18 year olds and you give them this material and you get them to participate and you get them to make the changes and you get them to become involved in their communities, oh my gosh, they've got another 50 or 60, 70 years ahead of them. They can make a great big, huge difference. That's why this, this push on young people. That's why you hear the excitement in my voice that working with young people in your community, whether it's as a volunteer at a youth center or as an educator or as someone in your church and you work with the youth group, whatever your community has in around, working with young people is so rewarding because if you change them, we have a greater hope of changing the future. And if we're not trying to change the future for the better, why are we on this earth? Well, there you have it, folks. I, do I need to say anything else? The, we're not just pulling this out of nowhere a thousand times more. Do I think science, technology, engineering, and math are important? Yes. Do I think they're 1,000 times more important than civics? No, uh, I do not. And so, yeah, the answer, if we're not going to change the length of the school day, is that other subjects have to give. But frankly, I think as the article points out, we've done that before in our history, right? We have adjusted what we're teaching to our young people and how we're teaching it to them to meet the needs of our society, to address challenges that we're facing. And if we fail to do that in this uh, instance, we could be into a much larger problem. Well, you know, you've been talking to local businesses as director of the youth center and talking about funds and trying to get the the different connections. And And what did they tell you? Yes, they want workers that they can train, but they need somebody who will show up, right? Yep. I mean, it's like, okay, we're, we're, we're teaching all this STEM, which I agree with you. That is, that is good. Obviously, I'm a former social studies teacher. So <laughs> civics is very important to me. <laughs> yeah. But, and I, but I understand in today's. And American history teacher. Right. And yeah. I, I understand the technology part of things is very important. But our local businesses are saying, we can't find people who will show up to work every day. So what does it matter? what you're teaching them if if you're not teaching them the value of hard work and showing up every day. I, I, you can be the greatest STEM student in the world, but if you haven't been taught the value that you show up to work on time every day and you put in a full day's work for your pay, what good does all that STEM education do? We can spend all the time we want in the world on STEM, but if we don't have engaged citizens who care about making the country better, who want to show up and vote, who cares? I mean, honestly, what good does it do if we can't get along as a nation, if we can't make progress together as a country? What good does any of that do? Oh, yeah, well, we, we really got them educated on science. They, they really know their science, but they hate each other outside of school and they can't have a conversation without yelling at each other and they don't know how to go vote. Uh, you know, I mean, I don't know. I'm sorry, but it seems backwards. It's like it's the cart before the horse thing of we can add that other stuff in. But if we don't have the basics down, because the example that Lance is giving is, OK, well, you've got a high school graduate from Urbana High School. And this is a very real example. They got, you know, whatever bees, let's say, in science, and they're going to go out and get a job at Rital, one of our local manufacturers. And they're going to they're going to start at about $16, $17 an hour. Nothing that they learned in science probably, you know, is going to be directly imperative to them making that money. Doesn't mean they shouldn't learn science, but it means we've got to rethink they they are going to need to know how to vote. You know, they are going to need to know how to keep a schedule and show up on time and how to work hard. Those things they got to have in order to be the best at that job. They probably don't have to have advanced biology. You know, they probably don't have to have, you know, advanced English literature. And and that's not, again, not criticizing those subjects because I'm somebody that took those subjects and I think they have value, but it's, we have to think about how we're prioritizing what we're doing if we want a nation that, that doesn't march on its own capital, that doesn't allow... Um, you know, the Confederate flag to be flown from the steps, uh, an enemy, you know, and some people won't like this, but it's the reality, a, a former enemy nation that was defeated by us in battle 
we allow that flag to be flown on the steps of our capital. The only time that our own country people took over our own capital. You know what I mean? That's what we've arrived at because we don't know how to get along anymore. And that's the kind of stuff that happens. So I think it's a great point, Lance. And that's exactly why the last thing that we have to talk about is that march on the Capitol and a teacher who was there. When she got home, the fight began. Should teachers be held accountable for what they do outside of the classroom? If so, to what extent? To find out, keep it here on The State of Us. We'll be right back. We are The State of Us. Here's your host, Justin T. Weller. Christine was a beloved fourth grade teacher. Then came the pandemic, the election, and the January 6th riot in Washington. She's from California, and before long, word got around when Christine was spotted a public mask burning, and when she appeared in a video sitting on stage uh, as her husband spoke at a QAnon convention, people talked when she angrily accosted a family wearing masks near a local surfing spot, her granddaughter in tow. Yet, the other side of this story, Lance, and this article is linked at thestateofus.org, it's a New York Times piece, And the piece points this out. You'd be hard pressed. In fact, the New York Times couldn't find any student that she's taught in her many years of teaching that said that she appeared to allow any of that to enter the classroom, right? That she ever behaved in in even the slightest hint of a racist way toward any student or ever treated a student differently for their beliefs. There's no at least so far, evidence of that. And in fact, parents fought up until just recently to get their students into her classroom because she was renowned as a good teacher. Now this stuff gets out on social media and there's a petition to have the school board take some kind of action, maybe fire her. Interesting. You'll wonder why it's hard to get good people or to get people to want to be teachers. It's because as a teacher, rightfully or wrongly, and this is the debate, are judged by what they do personally because they're put in charge of young people. And if you have a job, here to me is the question, should you be judged by what you do outside of your job, or should you be judged on how you do your job? You get hired to do a job. You do that job. You do that job by all appearances very well. The people who you work for say you do a good job, and by that I mean the students and the parents in your classroom, they say you do a good job. And then in your private life, your private life, you go out there and you do what you're legally allowed to do. Let's get that straight, okay? That you are allowed to march. You, We just got done saying, oh, we need civics. You need to go out there and stand up for what you believe in. And you do that, but you run the risk of losing your job because of what your job is. I, I have a real hard time with that. Having lived it um, my entire adult working life, knowing that <clears throat> what I did privately while legal in the eyes of the law might cause me problem in my job because I worked with young people. Not anything I did at my job, but what I did in my private life that was legal could affect my job. I have a real hard time with that. Now, you got lots of questions. I know I'll, I'll, I'll let you go with that. I, I'm choosing my words very carefully because I've had to do that my entire life, being an educator, working with young people. Take it where you want to go, but there's my viewpoint. I have a really hard time with people being hurt in their job for what they do that's legal in their private life. And that's, you're saying, well, you're being very specific there. Yeah, because if you do something illegal, it should affect your job. Okay, but but we're not going on a march, attending a political rally, while it may not be 
the same thoughts. Where, where's the freedom of speech? Where's the freedom of expression for public employees? You mean I can't go in and do a good job? I can't teach your kids? I can't, I, I can't serve you as your, I'm thinking of something you go in and pay your water bill or whatever. I can't do that well. Just because I have a different political outlook than you do? On the one hand, I absolutely, I agree with the notion that you should be judged primarily based on the work you do. And and this is part of why I love the state of us folks is because we can have a nuanced discussion. And I think too often uh, we've, we live in a media culture that is not about the details. It's about the two second sound bite, you know, that's exciting. And frankly, that's not what we're here to do. We're here to to have a conversation like this, which frankly, they wouldn't give you the time to have on mainstream media because we're telling you it's complicated, right? I mean, even in Lance's answer, very specific about there's a point where you cross that line, right? I mean, by all accounts, this teacher didn't go up the steps and did not unlawfully enter the Capitol. She was part of the peaceful portion of the protest. And that might, that might seem like a very, you know, ooh, distinction, but she didn't break the law, right? She was exercising a right to free speech, might not be speech that we agree with or that we like, but should you lose your job just because when you were on your own time, you did something that somebody else didn't like? I don't know. To to me, Lance, it sounds like this path that we're on of you can only say things if I like what you say. That's what leads us to another civil war. Freedom of speech means you have the freedom to say what you want as long as you're not harming another individual. As long as you are not actively doing something to harm someone. And it's a difference of opinion. And it's okay. I mean, I was listening and reading the excerpts of... um former Speaker of the House, John Boehner's book is going to be released. And he said, I've got Republican friends. I've got Democratic friends. And when we talk about politics, we don't agree, but we can have a civil conversation on the issues. And I feel like we can't do that anymore. It's like, if you, if you don't say it the way that people, some people want you to say it, then they're going to attack you and try to take your job away from you. They're going to take, they're going to do this to you. And it's like, wait a minute. What just happened to civil discourse? You know, and here's, and again, John well, Boehner, John Boehner, if you don't know, is a contemporary of mine as far as age is concerned. And he was Speaker of the House who was basically run out by the right wing of the Republican Party because he wasn't right wing enough. And he got out of politics. And he was part of the last group that did some bipartisan stuff in Congress in his new book. Not plugging it because I haven't read it, but reading some of the press releases and, and listening to him on on television, he's like, yeah, that's the problem right now is that Republicans aren't even friends with Republicans. Democrats aren't even friends with Democrats. Everybody's out there with their own agenda and there's no give and take and people aren't understanding that we can be friends even though we don't agree politically. You know, Justin and I are friends and we don't agree on everything. I mean, we, we, we have some really heated discussions sometimes on air, but almost always before we go on air. Um, we don't always agree, but that doesn't mean we're not friends. We spend a lot of time together, but we feel free to have this discourse because we know that the bottom line is we're both trying to do what's best. And we may not agree with what's best, what the best course of action we is. We both say things that we probably wouldn't say just generally right to a random person or we wouldn't say them the same way, but that's because we feel like we're in a place where even though the other person may not agree with us, we know they understand our intent and that they're not going to judge us just, just for the words being used to explain something that one of us maybe doesn't fully understand. You know, there, it's like there's intent I, and trust. Exactly. And there, that intent and trust is there because we've had these conversations. Yes. And if you don't have the conversations, then you can't have the trust. And that's yep. what we don't have anymore. We talk at one another instead of to one another as a society. And, and so, and so then words are taken out of context because, well, this is what they said. So this is what they meant. Well, you don't, you don't know that because you've never had a conversation with them. Right. So you're assuming. 
and we know what assuming means, right? Yeah. And if you don't, <laughs> you text yeah. me, you know, get, send us an email and I'll explain it to you. But if you don't understand uh, the true meaning of assuming, yes. I can't do that on the air. Yes, Brett Brett reminds me of that all the time. If I make an assumption, he'll say, you know what that means? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I know. That's, but that's why we need that civics education, right? Is we've got to make sure people understand, one, our complicated history as a nation. Don't boil it down to all good because it isn't. And also make sure that people know the value uh, of losing. Because the other thing is, Lance, that insurrection... I don't know. Does that happen if people better understand losing? You know, it, that's uh, that, I, I, no, that's I just, a good question. It, you know, we're, we're running right? out of time. We'll pick that up again. But but that's a great, <laughs> that's saying, a great question. I, yeah. I mean, that's as I'm thinking let about know, this. Let teacher us know what and, you think about that, folks. There's the question that Justin's thrown out. Email us. Email Justin at podcast at the state of us dot org and tell us what you think. What what effect would would the that idea have? On the insurrection. If we had if we had better history and civics education, if we let kids lose and taught them how to rise appropriately and constructively out with of losing. loss. Right. Right. And if we didn't just cancel people who have made, you know, a choice in their private life that wasn't illegal, you know, but that we didn't like, what how would the nation look different? Maybe we're drawing lines and, you know, connections that we shouldn't be. And if you think so, we want to hear from you. Podcast at thestateofus.org. When's the last time, Lance, that you heard uh, media host encourage people who disagree to tell us what they think? I don't know. And, I, I don't and, think you hear and, that well, often enough. And not do it in a sarcastic way. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Because we really, 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 yeah, oh, yeah. Let me know if you don't agree with me because I know I'm right and you're right, wrong. Yeah. So let me hear about how stupid you are. <laughs> right. And that's not what we're doing. We want to honestly know, you know, are we off base? You know, are we totally wrong? Or do you think we're onto something? And is this something that we could, you know, push out there to everybody that would lead to a better America and a better world? So, Lance, what are we trying to accomplish here on The State of Us? You, you almost said it there. I did. I was, well, I was, I was hinting at it. But our mission here at True Chat is to educate people by providing honest, open, and respectful conversations. And that's what we want. Honest, open, and respectful means that we can have a difference of opinion. But we can have, we can still talk. We can talk and I can learn from you and you can learn from me. And that's what we want here at this station. So if you like that concept and you're talking to your family and friends about it and they say, well, that sounds like something I would like to get involved with. We'd love to have them as listeners and as correspondents. So let them know that they can find our show on Spotify, Overcast, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, and everywhere podcasts are found. The State of Us is a podcast released Tuesdays and Thursdays by 4 a.m. Eastern Time and is also a syndicated radio program heard in select stock markets around the nation. For The State of Us on True Chat in Urbana, Ohio, I'm Justin T. Weller. And I'm Lance Jackson. Special thanks to our producer, Bradley Butch, and thank you all, our audience, for tuning in. We'll see you next time. Be the change. Be sure to check out our website, thestateofus.org, for books, articles, and all the ways to tune in, thestateofus.org.